Greetings, everyone. Pete Pardo here from Sea of Tranquility. Welcome to another edition of Ranking the Albums. Today, we're going to take a look at a band that's been asked for by many, many people. Magnum, that great UK hard rock, melodic rock, prog band. They've been called many, many things. And I've got the perfect co-guest host here to help me out with him. Please welcome to the YouTube channel for the very first time, although he's been a Sea of Tranquility writer for like a decade, Stephen Reed, all the way over from Scotland. Stephen, what's happening? Thanks for coming on the show here. It's an absolute pleasure, and I can't believe that you've given me such a difficult assignment for the first time on See such that? a good band, such strong albums, ranking these the best of the best, in my <laughs> opinion. I'm very interested to see what you're going to have. Cool. Well, you know, as your editor, I figure I'd give you a tough assignment for your first day on the job here on the YouTube channel. So, you know, um, I, and, and you know, it's funny because Steve and I obviously know each other a long time, but we've only just gotten introduced face to face via this wonderful thing called Zoom recently, even though we've been working together on the website for a, what seems like a million years. And I have known for a long time that Magnum is one of his favorite bands. So yeah. as everybody's been asking for me to do Magnum, I was like, you know what, guy, I like Magnum a lot. Um, maybe not as knowledgeable about them as other people might be. And then I'm like, but wait a second, Steven is a big fan and has been a big fan for probably longer than I have. So when we first started talking about getting him on the channel on the show, I figured this is the first place, to, the best place to start. So um, 20 albums, guys, a lot of studio albums. So we don't want to make this a ridiculously epic episode. So we're going to kind of each go through our rankings here, starting from 20, go down to one. We'll talk about albums and songs, uh, you know, as much as we can without uh, taking up too much time. But I think he's as interested as I am to see how he ranks these because right before we went on the air, we were talking about how tough this is because this band really doesn't have any bad albums. Mm -hmm. yep, and, you know, some people are going to really lean towards the early part of the career, but man, and, and you'd said it, and I'll let you talk about it in a second here. You know, they broke up for a few years, but since they got back together, all their albums are like equally as good just about, right? I mean, yeah. yeah. The, the, the catalog's amazingly strong. I think right away from the start, there's different eras, there's different sounds. I liked all of the descriptions that you gave, hard rock, prog rock, I'll throw pomp rock in there. I yeah, think pomp, pomp is a good, band. yeah, exactly. Maybe yeah. a little bit more of a UK sound in the pomp side of things. They're not quite that sort of sticks sort of thing, but there's an element of that. There's a bit of prog, a bit of mystique. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, interesting that the, the latter stuff, the newer stuff, since the Hard Rain albums, they're very consistent. The thing that struck me listening back to all 20 albums in the space of a couple of days just to reacquaint myself is how similar some of the new stuff can be when you listen to it back to back. Hadn't necessarily realized that in the same way. It's made this even harder. <laughs> Very similar and of equal quality, right? Yeah, they're, they're all really good. And I've, I didn't mean to do what I've done, but I'm interested. I'll let you know at a certain point, there's something that happened along the way that I hadn't anticipated. Hmm, okay, very cool. And before we get started, I have to bring it up. You, know, you mentioned sticks before, and I think that's a good kind of comparison. So as someone who's from the UK, who has been able to experience the popularity of this band in your own country. Mm -hmm. Why do you think this band never made it here in the US? Oh, well, there's a, di I mean, I'm, I'm obviously Scotsman. There's a bit of an Englishness about them, I think. And that doesn't always translate so well. I think sometimes that they're too subtle. Although they can be a hard rock band and there are some great hard rock songs on there that's not always the message right and i think sometimes that's maybe struggle to translate they've never <sighs> i'm not going to give away too much there are some albums that have hits on them that weren't hits but a yeah. lot of the albums are more i think journeys you start at the beginning you finish at the end and it tells you a story yeah but there was not much there that was going to break them in terms of well that's the hit that's the song that's going to punch them through. And I think that's possible because it's so good from start to finish as opposed to having two great songs and a lot of filler. So in other words, they're more of an album band, which I think so, yeah. again is not a bad thing, but here in the States, people are looking for hits. But in yeah. saying that, you listen to a lot of these albums 
and there's some very hit worthy songs here that's there are songs that are just as catchy as a lot of things that were played to death on the radio here in the states that i mean i listen to some of this magnum stuff i'm like i, I can totally see u.s rock fans totally getting into this band and, and another thing too they never toured here and i'm sure that had a lot to do with it as well because here in the 80s especially you got to play live here for the people and promote your albums and they i mean when was the last time they came here i i couldn't even tell oh. you Early eighties, like, I would imagine so. I mean, there was a period here where they were starting to do things like Wembley Arena and things like that. But even over here, that period wasn't long. I mean, they're a big band here. They're a known name, but they've never been a, a very short period of time. They were a chart act, yeah. So they've never really had even that breakthrough over here. And I would say now that they're a big niche band over here. They're not. They're not going to sell out arenas. They're still playing kind of bigger clubs and all that sort of right. great, great gigs, great venues, the sort of right place to hear that sort of music. But even over here, they can sell those venues out, but move them into, you know, the bigger halls. That's not really where they're at. No. It's interesting. No. Yeah, it is interesting. I, yeah, I did a show on the Kinks the other day, and that's another band here who were never really huge here in the States. Most people know who they are. They can name a song or two or three, but beyond that, not really. Uh, Status Quo is another one. Slade. These are yeah. all bands that are very well known in your neck of the woods, but here, mm, not really. And it's but a shame. With those other three that you mentioned, though, I think there's a lot of influence on American music from those three bands. Not, yeah. but Magnum's influence doesn't necessarily show in the same way. Right. That's right. an interesting thing. Possibly yeah. because they evolved at the start from a more progressive band into that kind of pomp sort of sound. And since Hard Rain, I think they're more hard rock, but it's more kind of progressive hard rock. Yeah. I, I don't know if there was, I don't know if they didn't, maybe they showed their influences too strongly in the early albums. Yeah. To actually be. be an influence. <clears throat> yep. You know? And for those of our viewers who are kind of wondering what we're talking about with pomp rock, uh, this is like a term that I don't know where, the, where it came from, critics or fans back in late 70s, early 80s. Yep. For bands that are, I guess, at their core, a hard rock band, but they've got this kind of um, very accessible sound with lots of big keyboards, big choruses. So other bands that come, you know, Sticks were called that for a while. Uh, Journey, I think, got that tag a little bit. Aviary, okay. Angel, you know, I mean, that, that sort of thing. And big hooks, melodies, lots of keyboards, hard rock guitars, but pomp always seem to get thrown to bands that really didn't fit into any other nice little that's that's exactly category. what i was going to say as you had mentioned in bands like journey well that's that's aor that's classic aor well mag never been an aor band yeah you know but there's there's prog in there and that's maybe why it's never translated into hits it's not Could quite be. one thing or the other and Could i think very well some be. people do get confused by that a little bit and and they need to dig a bit deeper to find out the fact that it's all great but there's not necessarily those that niche to put them in. We like to put bands in boxes, don't we? We do. And yeah. Magnum until the last ten years haven't really fitted into a box. They've evolved all the way through the early years and never quite settled on a sound. That to me is a strength. Yeah. But it doesn't always mean that you're going to get that massive success. Yeah. No, very true. Very true. So now that we've set everybody up for the catalog, right? I'll let Stephen start off with his number 20. Hopefully by now, everybody, if you haven't listened to Magnum, you get somewhat of an idea of what to expect, but it'll be cool. Just, and again, where do you see these album cover guys? If, if, if you haven't, you know, Rodney Matthews did the bulk of their album covers throughout their career, yeah. and he's a fantastic artist. And I think you're going to be just as intrigued by seeing the album cover art as you will by actually going and listening to some of these albums if you haven't. So you're number 20, my friend. Kick us well, all off. Well, you've set that up perfectly because my number 20 doesn't have Rodney Matthews art on it. <laughs> okay. Of course, yeah. <laughs> it has Al Barrow's art on it, and Al Barrow was the bassist in the band at the time. Okay, and there's actually an interesting story that's recently gone up on their Facebook page, because he still runs that even though he's not in the band now, where he talks about the art from this era and how much of a compromise it is. So this album is Breath of Life. I would go as far as to say this is the magnum album I'm unsure of. The one out of 20, that's a, that's a good strike rate. The opening song, Cry, is maybe the only Magnum song that I don't like. <laughs> struggle, I struggle with the harmony vocals in them. I don't think they harmonize. 
But apart from that, it's not awful. I played it the other day, thoroughly enjoyed it. And that tells you how good this catalogue is. I thoroughly yeah. enjoyed it. And it's yep. number 20. So that, that's, that's, my, that's where I'm starting. 2002 on that particular one that's there. Right. Yeah. And, and, you know, what Stephen just said, we're going to echo a lot during this show. There, are, there really are no bad albums here. Uh, so even for those watching, if there's some albums that are like towards the bottom of our list that you absolutely love, I totally see that because this was difficult to do because with such quality throughout their catalog, it's really hard to yeah, put them in some kind of order because you enjoy all of them, right? To an extent. Yep. So my number 20, which is the only one I don't have, but I've listened to it and it's probably only sitting at the bottom of my list because I don't have much history with it is uh, sleepwalking from 1992. Yeah. I mean, it's, I wouldn't say too much because it's, it's obviously in the pile here. <laughs> that, that's, that's the start of, I suppose, in the public view, that's the wilderness years. Yeah. That's where that is. So I can understand that. Okay. So there you have it. All right. So uh, we'll move up to number 19. Not what it is for me, but I, I get it. That's okay. And like I said, if, if, if I had more, because I don't own it, and I've only just actually listened to it online a couple times, yep. it's kind of hard. So, But yet, if I spend more time with it, actually pick it up and we do and we talk we have this discussion a year from now it might actually rank higher so that's, yeah that's the trouble with having such a big discography all right number 19 Stephen, what do you got number 19 so this tells you what i think about certain eras of the band because we go from 2002 to 2004 so this is brand new morning so this is the album that followed breath of life okay this to me was a band refinding their form this was a band refinding their sound it sounds a bit like early magnum it sets them up for what's about to come. There's nothing wrong with it. It's still a good album. The title track sticks in my mind at the end of a day where I listened to four or five of their albums from about this era. That's the song that I was singing. So that's it still comes highly recommended. But to me, this is the era where they're not quite sure what they're going to do. They've been Hard Rain, which was kind of folk, kind of rock. It was good. We still had Tony Clarkin, who has written nearly every single song on every album that we'll show you here, which is an amazing feat in itself. Yeah. And they still had Bob Cartley singing, one of the most underrated singers in rock music. I'm not going to say pomp or prog or AOR, in rock music. And he's still on form here too, but to me that's still them finding their feet again. And that is the first Magnum album I ever owned. Right, okay, that's interesting. Exactly. And I, I want to say, you you mentioned something really important before. So Tony Clarkin, the guitar player and chief songwriter of this band. So he has been writing almost all of their songs for like 50 years, right? Almost 50 years. I mean, they, yeah, they, they formed in 72, but yeah. Kingdom of Madness was 78. But I mean, he was yeah, basically... But Kingdom of Madness was recorded a couple of years before. Before, that. right. So, and, I mean... With, and, and even before their debut, they had issues with Jet Records. Yeah. And that happened a couple of times early on. So you are going back. Yeah. Wow, I never actually thought about that. 45, it's a long time. Years. That's incredible. And yes, he's basically written every song we'll talk about. And that's kind of why we keep circling back to other parts of this conversation. I think there's such a consistency throughout their catalog because they basically had one guy writing the songs throughout yes. their history. Yeah. Okay. And I, I echo your sentiments about, um, about Bob Catley. Great singer. And a very unique voice. Nobody sounds yes. like him. Yeah. Absolutely. Nobody sounds like him. All right. So my number 19, I'm going to go with 1994's Rock Arts. Okay. Again, really solid record. You know, rock heavy and hard hearted woman. And it's tough to put any of these like down at the bottom of the list because they're just really, really yeah. strong. Absolutely. And uh, so I love me, that album cover art. Yep. For me, for 18, the first two here, my bottom two, I like them. They're not the best Magnum albums. I like them. From now you on- You like them, you don't love them. That's what I usually say. Yes, I like these, I don't the love them. Way. That's the best <laughs> way. I like them, I don't love them. From here until number six, I love them all, but there's five that go beyond for me. There you go. So yep. We're at Sacred Blood, Divine Lies, so 2016. So this is, we're still in that more recent era. This is still a really good album. I mean, there's uh, Princess and Rags, Quiet Rhapsody, great songs, great atmosphere. For me, the production, it doesn't lack a little bit, but it, there's not so many here that, that stay in my mind once I finish listening to this album again. But 
this gives a better idea of the art and the standard of the art that this band had. Absolutely stunning. Yeah. All the way through. Um, and yeah, so it's, we're now at a stage now where I'm struggling to say anything really negative about any of these. And that's, yeah. it's difficult because they're all good. Yeah. Uh, I was kind of curious if we would kind of hit any of these at the same. And my number uh, 18 is also the same album. And go. interestingly enough, you have a digipack and I've got the, uh, the jewel case version. So. I do, yes, indeed. Yeah. I like yours better. <laughs> yeah, this is... Well, I've got, I've got the fancy deluxe with the, with the uh, bonus. Ah, yeah, yeah. And I have a bunch of those, but that... Yeah, yeah that's... I can't help myself. So, yeah, this is a thing of beauty. SPV Steamhammer did a very good job on a lot of those type of releases yes, over the did. years. Absolutely, so. they do. All right, number 17. Well, I'll go from one end to the other end. Excuse me while I move that. Aha. Uh -huh. So we're wow. all the way. Right, there you go. See, there's oh, a shot look on the yeah. face. Wow. So we're all the way to Magnum 2. So to me, the first two albums have a feel that's different to everything else. They were a bit more progressive, a yeah. bit darker. The production, and, it, and obviously I'm still going back and listening to vinyl. I've not done remasters. You'll find as we do some of these, I don't really do remasters so much. I like to listen to the crackly old vinyl and get that vibe. Yes, I'm a bit of an anorak, that's fine. Okay, but this, is, this is still a great album, and there's songs on here, there's, there's changes, there's Foolish Heart. But to me, when you listen to the live albums, or if you're lucky enough to have seen them live, as I have a few times, they changed these songs, and they made them into something else. And that, to me, it's still a band, I said that about the era after Hard Rain, but this is a band finding themselves. This is, this is a really good album, and that shows how good everything else is going to be. But yeah. To me, there's a little bit of filler on here, not much. So that's that's where I'm at with that one. Ooh, wow, yeah, you surprised me with that one. There we go. 1979 we are for that. Yeah, I know. My God, it's so long ago. Yeah, it's amazing. Long ago. My number 17 from 2011, The Visitation. Ah, right, okay. Strong that's album. Interesting. That's interesting. Strong oh, album, right? Yeah. I mean, yep. Black Skies. And you know what? Uh, and I talk a lot about this on the show about certain bands. Certain bands are very good with putting a really, really strong track to kick off things. And yep. Magnum is one of those bands. And I think it's like indeed. Black Skies, Doors to Nowhere is terrific. Yeah. Uh, Spin Like a Wheel. It's really good stuff on here. And again, it pains me that it's coming down so low and it's not because well, I don't... You'll, you'll, you'll find out that that pains me. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, all right. So, yeah. So, it's interesting. Number 17. So, you had one that I have a lot higher and it's probably vice versa. Yep. So, okay. That's yeah, yeah. fine. All right. 16. What do you got? I have got Goodnight Ellie. Now, this is interesting because you spoke about why did this band never make it in America? This is when they tried. This is an album that's got a mixture of songwriters. We've got uh, Jim Valance on here, we have got Russ Ballard writing songs on here, it's not all Tony Clarkin. This is a really good album. It's not necessarily a really good Magnum album. This is a bit more AOR, it's a bit more polished, it's a bit more smooth. You can almost feel that they don't like doing it. And that's the interesting thing for me, is they do it really well, but it's not Magnum. But having said that, Rocking Chair that opens it, exactly what you say, that's a punchy song. That's yeah. a great one. It's a good place to start if you've never heard them, I have to say. Mama that follows it, that's fantastic as well. Heartbroken Busted, that's a classic. They played that a lot live. Really good album, not necessarily a really good magnum album. So we're at 1990 with this one. Yeah. Still love it. This is there what they look like for anyone that's not sure what they look like. Tony the, the Hat Clarkin, because yeah, he still got right. a hat on at this stage. <laughs> Only to the heart of the discovery is completely bald underneath, but there you go. <laughs> That's right, he is, yeah. <laughs> and Stephen's right, you know, the record company really wanted to make that their big break in the U.S., and it, yeah. it, it just didn't, didn't happen, happen at all. Didn't, didn't happen, happen at all. All right, my number 16, again, I dig this one quite a bit, Princess Alice and the Broken Arrow from, uh, what is this, 2007. Yep. Really good, and a, a great Rodney Matthews uh, yeah, cover. That's right a classic there. cover. Yeah, and it's, uh, again, this is one of those strings of releases that are just really kind of hard to separate because they're almost like a continuation from each other. Really high quality, ultra memorable yeah. songs. And, uh, you know, I have nothing bad to say about it. You know, when we were younger, another kick off, you know, yeah. opening track, really, really good. Uh, like Brothers We Stand, 
anthemic. I mean, a lot of really good anthems on this album. Yeah. Inside Your Head, it's, you know, I, I, I dig think, it a lot. It's incredible that Tony Clarkin was writing these songs, doing most of the recording of these songs, and producing these songs. Yeah. And it's not self-indulgent. That's the thing for me. Lots of guys, lots of girls do that. It's a bit self-indulgent. Sometimes they don't have that quality. He seems to be able to do that, which is amazing. Absolutely amazing. Yeah. Right, so 15 for me. Yep. We've already seen this one. This is yep. Rock Art, as you say, from 1994. For me, this album's worth it for the Tall Ships alone. I love that song. It's just incredible. But same again, this to me, this was the final album before Tony decided to go and do something different. He admits himself at this stage, Magnum, he didn't quite know what Magnum was anymore. And that, and that to me is Good Night LA through Sleepwalking into this. He kind of lost where they were, needed to do something different to get his head straight. Took a few years out, did two albums with Hard Rain, which was still him doing everything. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that kind of feel, this one kind of feels this way. I still really like this, but you can kind of feel that they're needing to do something different. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. Yeah, it's good. It's a fun album. All right, I'm going to go number 15, Breath of Life, which you've already brought up. Yep. Uh, you know, again, it's among the batch of first Magnum albums I ever got into, so it kind of holds a little special place for me. But I will say it's a little bit more on the mellow side yep. compared to some of the other albums. That, yep. Not that that's a bad thing. Yep. Um, yeah, and Cry is definitely not one of their better opening tracks. I yeah. agree with you on that. As I said, it's the only one I'm not keen on, I think, of the whole thing. Yeah, exactly. All right, 14, what do you got? I've got Escape from the Shadow Garden. Yeah. That's where I'm at now. This one gets a lot of love. When, when you look online and you read reviews from the time, this gets a lot of love. I can see why. It just doesn't quite have enough character for me, this one to shine through in a way that some of the other ones from this era do. But I can completely understand why people do love it. I mean, the art tells the story. These are yeah. atmospheric albums. And you have to spend a bit of time to get to know them. So it's still really good to say, well, 2014 for this one, Too Many Clowns, Midnight Angel. That's what I've written down as kind of my highlights from this album. Lots of good stuff here. It's still a good place to start. It just doesn't quite, it's not quite as good as some of the ones, later ones for me. Yeah, no, I hear you. If, if you're going to pick like maybe three or four from the more recent albums, I would definitely pick that one, that as one of them. I'm not surprised to hear that. Yep. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, but, you I, know, I, I know that I'm a little bit out on a limb with that one. Yeah, but it's good. I mean, I totally, you know, and well, we'll get to it in a second, but um, yep. it's just got, it's got all their characteristics, the big hooks, the big keyboards, you know, the crisp guitar riffs. And, and I want to touch on something that you mentioned just a couple minutes ago about um, these albums and his songwriting being not self-indulgent. He writes for the song and yeah. he always has. So yeah. if you're looking to come into the world of Magnum's music, looking for long guitar solos and dual guitar keyboard trade-offs and complex, you know, arrangements, these guys aren't about that. Yeah, it, it's subtle prog. There's, it right. is progressive, but right. it's subtle. It's not about how technically brilliant they are. And 15 minute long songs and all that, not at all, yeah. The, the great thing for me is that he knows that the singer in his band is phenomenal. Yeah. And, and as a guitarist and songwriter, he allows the singer to shine. That's rare. Yeah. It's, it's clever, it's really good. Yeah, it definitely is. All right, what number are we up to? 14? All right, uh, Lost on 14, the Road? I think you're at 14. Yeah, Lost on the Road to Eternity from 2018. Did you mention this one yet? I'm trying to- No, not yet. No, not yet, okay, again. I was really into this when it came out and I, you know, their last couple, in my opinion, are very, very good. It just, again, yeah. just goes to show you that we have a lot more to go and yeah. it's like- And we're raving know, about albums, yeah. Right, you know, and uh, I do need to show you this. I mean, if you, if, if you folks are like into like Roger Dean and you haven't checked out Rodney Matthews, I mean, he is special, special artist and he's a really nice guy. So- Lots of good stuff on his website too. Yeah, oh, absolutely, there is. Absolutely. I mean, treasure trove on his website. Yeah. Show me your hands, peaches and cream. That, you know, good stuff. Yeah. Big, yeah, big music. I love it. Okay, so I'm at number 13, and I'm heading into the Valley of the Moon King. Mm. Okay, so we're at 2009 here. As I say, this is another great album, Facing the Crowd. Uh, no one knows his name. 
Blood on Your Barbed Wire Thorns. Tony liked a long album title and a long song title at this stage. <laughs> yeah. As you say, there's not many epics. He doesn't do 15 minute long ones, but it takes about 15 minutes to say some of the album names. That's you true, know? yeah. That is but true. it works well with the art. This is, this is what, at a stage now where I can't find any chinks in the armour, there's just other ones that I prefer more than this. But th this is a really good album too. Yeah, if I remember correctly, when that came out, um, you know, because everybody who follows the website know we do like our best of the year at the end of the year. And I, I always marvel every year that Magnum releases an album. I know Steven's going to have their release somewhere in his top 30 or so. Yeah. And I remember yeah. that year, I think that album was in a couple of ours uh, at the yeah. top of the list, which is, you know, good to see. It's, it's a solid, solid record. I dig it quite a bit. Um, all right. Number 13 for me, Escape from the Shadow Garden. From 2014. Yeah. Yeah. Just looking at that. You've got the nice digi on that one. I've got the jewel case on that uh, one. See that? Look at it. We're opposite. <laughs> yeah, there, so. See. so we're both jealous now. Yeah. Live Till You Die, Unwritten Sacrifice. Yep. Too Many Clowns, The Art of Compromise. It's a great album. I, I dig it. It's, it's good stuff. You're up. Okay. So we're all the way. See, there you go. That's a shocked look on the face. Uh, be, yeah, I'm very shocked, yeah. <laughs> this, this is where it began. This is David. Yeah. This is a great album. To me, Magnum 2 suffered from being that second album. They were a band that had been out and played a lot. This took a long time to come out after they'd formed, written the songs, recorded them. But Magnum 2 felt like that sort of, these are the second best songs. These, I mean, there's some classic stuff on here. The title track, in the beginning, that's the way to start a career, isn't it? And the yeah. keyboards on that song are mm -hmm. outstanding. Absolutely outstanding. I mean, there's Invasion on here. I'm talking myself into this being one of the best albums because it's one of the best albums. I'm not even <laughs> in the top 10 yet. This is a great <laughs> album. Maybe I'm a little bit, because the artwork over here, I don't know if you've got the US artwork. But I have the same one, yeah. It's, yeah. Right? It doesn't really do very much exciting. I can understand why people wouldn't pick that out of the, the racks. Back in the day when you had all this great art to go. Yeah. But yeah, I, I'm a massive fan. We're at number 12 here, and I'm telling you what a fantastic album this is. And it is, it is a fantastic album. It is. And I will say, for those of you who are watching who have never listened to this band before, and maybe you're a real big prog rock fan, that's the one to start with. That's, that's where to go. I would agree with that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. All right. My number 12 from 2012 on the 13th day. Yep. Good rocking album, this one. Yeah. This one's got some, some heft to it, I think, you know? I, I really like what you did with the production on that album. I think it does, yeah. it, it grabs you. It doesn't yeah. let you go. No, not at all. You know, all the dreamers and the title track is really good. Uh, Dance on the Black Tattoo. It's good yeah. stuff. That's a great song. Good stuff. And another, you know, really strong, I think, Rodney Matthews. I like that one because it's a little bit different. That, one, that, that artwork feels a little bit more modern, but it's it still him. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's like really uh, good. Well, it's all well, you got yeah. is the cover on that one, but uh, it's it's got this kind of like little devilish creature on it, which I think is pretty cool. But I like this album, fun album. Okay, all right, number so eleven. Number eleven. So I'm at Sleepwalking here. Oh, much higher than me. Yeah, much higher than you. Now I didn't really like this when it came out. Strangely enough, I bought the I bought the single only in America. It didn't really connect. I, it felt to me this is right after. Uh, Good Night LA. So we're at 1992 here. And this, to me, Good Night LA was an experiment that was maybe forced upon them and it didn't work. This is a band coming out of that. It's still got that AOR feel. This is not pomp. It's not prog. There are some moments on there like that. I mean, there's stuff on here. There's, there's Stormy Weather. There's Only in America. There's Sleepwalking. You're the one. You're the one's more of a kind of ballad. They do them really well, by the way, for right. like a ballad. This is a really good band for you too. But as I say, this kind of good night early, into sleepwalking, into rock up. This is a band that's it's tapering. It's still great, but it's tapering a little bit. Yeah. And for those who are probably wondering, that album cover, to me, always thought that that's kind of like a weird take on Marillion's Fugazi. I mean, does it look kind of similar? The, the bedroom an scene, and, bedroom right? Feel. The thing <laughs> I like about these albums, and you can't see it, you won't see it, is these pictures on the back, there are other album covers from the catalog. And I liked that. There's, all, there's so clever. many albums that have got little Easter eggs before there was Easter eggs, before they were a thing. Yeah. That if you have a look and you can go and discover them, 
and I loved all that. That, that drew me in. I liked the, they always seem to be telling you a story. Yeah. And I like to be told a story. So well, it's very happens. clever, and not a lot yeah. of bands or you know artists who are working with bands go to those lengths at all. And it's well, nice it's, to see that extra little yeah. bit of effort and, there. And it's interesting that you mentioned Fugazi because Marillion at that stage they stuck with the same artist, it's Mark Wilkinson, doing yeah. those early albums, so they could tell a story because the artist understood the story. They were part of it. Well, this is an artist that's part of the story. That he's part of the Magnum story. He had a period yeah. where he yeah. wasn't. But he's part of the Magnum story. I, I, I like that too. Yeah, it's great when you have those uh, artists that work with those bands. You know, Travis, uh, I mean, um, Derek uh, Riggs, who works with um, yeah. Derek Iron Riggs, Maiden. right? With Iron yeah. Maiden, yeah. So you get these kind of like from album to album yeah. to album. It's, you got well, interestingly, that. it's now Mark Wilkinson that's doing Eddie. Yeah, I know, right? Yeah, very yeah, it's good. It's funny, it all goes round and round. Mark is a great artist. Yeah, it's going he around full a, circle. And he's another of. guy. He's a great guy too. Yeah. Yeah. All right, my number 11 might rank higher for some people. I know there are some folks who love this album and some who are kind of like, not as much. I think this is a very kind of commercial album for them. And again, one of those albums that in a perfect world would have been huge everywhere. I'm going to go with Vigilante okay. from 1986. Again, okay. mid-80s. I've tried to hide the shock on my face there. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, a lot, of, a lot of Magnum fans. Yeah. This is, this is, you know, but uh, and I think this is a really great album. And again, Eleven is no slouch on this big list, but um, I think they were going for a certain type of commercial sound, very accessible, and it works. It works. Uh, I just think I prefer others better, but it, it this yeah. is it's a great album. Yeah, you know. So I, uh, you know, Lonely Nights, Red on the Highway. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah. When you're a know, Holy Rider. The title track. It's, it's Holy good. Rider's the one that stays in my mind off that album. I sing, I'll be singing that song all night now. You've even said there we go. <laughs> so all right, the top, top 10. 10. Top 10. Top 10. Top 10, yeah. but it's the 11th hour. And here yeah. we go. This is great artwork. This is great artwork. That is, yeah, I love that one. You know, absolutely stunning. Frustratingly, there's no track list on the back. I don't like that, but I can, I can let it go when it looks as good as yeah. this. This, this is a band, to me, they, they've found their mojo now. They've done their first couple of albums. They know what they're about. Side one on this album. Oh, man, oh, man. It's, it just doesn't get much better than, than, than side one on this album. Do you know, I mean, you've got, you've got the prize, you've got breakdown, you've got the great disaster, you've got vicious companions, you've got so far away. It's just stunning from start to finish. And then side two lets it down a little bit for me. The, there's a, a kind of it doesn't quite know what it is quite so well still a great album though. it's a great album so Stephen have you ever have you ever seen the Police Academy movies I have okay so I want I want you to show that album cover again tell me that guy on the front doesn't look like Bobcat Goldthwait <laughs> right I always thought so it looks just like him I will never look at this album the same again <laughs> you have ruined this album <laughs> <laughs> but doesn't it now that you look at it doesn't it look exactly like him back in those days That's I remember the first time I got the, when I first got that album I'm like how did he get Bobcat on the cover here it looks just like him <laughs> That's it I'm gonna this is now number 20 no it's not <laughs> <laughs> Oh man oh, I can't believe you've just done that to me <laughs> Sorry I ruin your perception of that album forever now Absolutely you have <laughs> All right, my number 10, uh, I put this kind of high because this is one of the more recent ones I've gotten and I've really been enjoying it quite a bit. And again, maybe it's just because it's kind of new for me and everything like that, but I'm gonna go with Goodnight LA from 1990 yep. on here. Uh, I just, it's got some really good songs and they're it's really, awesome. really memorable. And I, I get totally what you said that it kind of strays a little bit from the Magnum we know and love, but I still think it's pretty good. And I mean, Keith Olsen, producing yeah. by, you know, I mean, you, does you know what they were shooting for, right? Yeah, uh, I just think it's a real shame that this didn't do for them like what they wanted it to. And maybe it's for the better because- yeah, that's kind what of, I was going to say. I would, I think that where they were going to go from there, that, that's not where they were destined to be. And yeah. I think they're a better band for having tried it, taking the break and come back and doing, I think what they want to do. You can hear yeah. they want to do what they're doing now. Yeah, and maybe it's it's a good one-off kind of album, but did we want Magnum to become giant? I don't think so. Yeah, 
right. so when I put it on, I'm always surprised by how good it is. In my head, that's not a great album, and I listen to it, and it's a great album. Yeah, it is. It's um, it's it's a good, somewhat of a curiosity in their catalog. It's actually very, very good. So yeah, absolutely. All so right. number nine for me is the one that when I went to listen to all these albums, I discovered that I only have as a download when I reviewed it. So that was a bit of a shock. So it's on order. I thought it would be here to do that with it right now, but it's not. So somebody somewhere has let me down with a post. But there you go. So this is Lost on the Road to Eternity. So we're in 2018. This to me, we're heading into, that's it. Thank you very much. Um, and to me, the difficulty about the newer stuff is that there is a continuity. So breaking them up is quite difficult and choosing favourites is quite difficult. I, I, to me, sometimes it's more the production than the songs that stands out on the, on the later albums. There's just something about some of them that keeps them, it almost stops them from shouting, they whisper to you, they, they kind of cajole you into them. But with this one with, with songs like, as you say, Peaches and Cream, Without Love, and I do love the title track, Lost on the Road to Eternity. They, they, this is beginning to shout to me, this album. This is one that gets you early, holds you there. Um, so yeah. It's going to be in my collection very soon. <laughs> there you go. It's a good thing because it's a good one. It's a really good one. Yeah. I, I, I dig it a lot. I know that I didn't have it. <clears throat> yeah, I like it a lot. All right. Uh, here's another one that's also kind of a little on the mellower side and really accessible, but I love it for it. Uh, 1998 Wings of Heaven. Okay. Really catchy stuff on here. Really catchy stuff on Right? Here. I mean, it's just like, uh, you know, Wild Swan. Yeah. Great tune, different worlds. The vocals on Wild Swan. Oh, Quite incredible. Good. Days yeah. of No Trust. I mean, yeah. uh, Don't Wake the Lion. I mean, I just think that this is a, um, I know, and this album didn't do as well for them, if from what I uh, remember well, seeing. No, see, over here it did. <clears throat> it did, huh? Okay. That was the interesting thing. The, the, this was the album, uh, Start Talking Love, Days of No Trust, and the other single. The other one we're loving the title. You look at the back of that there. Oh, it started talking love. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They, were, they were hits over here. They were a chart band. I saw their videos on Top of the Pops. I mean, you didn't see Magnum on Top of the Pops. That wasn't a thing. This was when they were on the cusp of breaking it. And that, to me, is why Goodnight LA was forced upon them. And because it, they were just about to get to that stage where it was, it was going to happen. And rather than let them do it themselves, that, to me, was, here's a songwriter, here's a producer, go make it happen now. But they would have done it on their own, I think. Well, maybe they, they should have pushed have this them. here in the, in the States then, is what yeah, they should that, have done. That's the, I, album that should, that's the album that should have broken them in the States. I think. Yeah. And, you know, 1988, perfect time yeah. for it here. And, Absolutely. But two years later, that time is done. That's the Do thing. You know once, help them, and I'm going to be horrible here, is they're not a bunch of great looking guys. No, they're not. They're not. Do you know? I mean... They're not they're lovely guys. <laughs> they're, they're, they were never going to have that kind of, and they don't sound like these bands, but there was no John Bon Jovi in this band, was there? So, you no. know, so there, was, there was never going to be that video that was going to get that rotation because they were good looking guys playing catchy music. There's catchy music on this album. But the videos had to be something slightly different. So, yeah, and that it, it was all about the image at that point yeah. in time. So yeah, yeah I, I totally get you. Because, but it's a shame because I think the music the here and right around this period is tailor-made for fans who gobble that kind of stuff up. Yeah, I think so. I think so too. Okay, so what number are we on? We are at eight. Number eight. So we're at Princess Alice and the Broken Arrow. That's where I'm at. Okay. So same again. I've got the all singing, all dancing. So that's absolutely yeah, I mean, the that nice addition. Yeah. I like I yeah, like yours that, better than mine. I think I gotta I gotta go get that one. <laughs> yeah, but you you're winning with some and I'm winning with others, so that's okay. This is the one and the artwork kind of gives it away. We'll we'll come to it in a bit because neither of us have mentioned it yet. But this is it's seen very much as a as a follow up um to um, an album that comes a bit higher up in, in my list, shall we say, on a storyteller's night. Um, and it's kind of got that feel. This, to me, is one of the more modern albums that is recapturing an older sound, but moving it forward. Uh, and we're at the stage where I'm, I'm struggling to find anything that I, that I really don't love. 
at this stage now. Do you know? And I mean, picking highlights. So you see, when we were younger, your lies, dragons are real. What I like about these albums is the punchy. The drums on these albums are, are excellent. We're, we're Harry James from, from Thunder at, at this stage as well. And he's not the most technical drummer. He's not going to throw lots of fills at you. Doesn't need he's to be. Guy that's gonna, he's not even like an Ian Mosley who is so technical you don't notice. Ian Mosley's uh, he's a blur, but you don't hear it all the time. Harry James is keeping it simple. He's playing for the song. The hi-hat's quite high in the mix in these albums but it grounds it and it seems to just allow it to, to flourish. This, this is a great album. Yeah, I agree. And, uh, you know, if we were to do this again in a couple months, it would probably be even higher on my list. I had, like I said, this was tough. Uh, I really enjoyed all the more recent albums a lot. Um, yeah. and that, that one as well. And this next one, Into the Valley of the Moon King from 2009. I dig this album. It's good. Yeah. This is, you know, again, when I, I started listening to Magnum at the beginning of the 2000s and I... You know, again, as someone much newer to the band than you were, because you had already been with them for quite a while, yep. I was like, wow, this, this band is great. Putting out all these, you know, they've been around forever, and they're putting out all these new albums, and everyone is really good, and I, I enjoy this one a hell of a lot. Yeah. A lot. I mean, as I said earlier on, from me, from number six down to number 18, I mean, that's a lot of albums we're talking about here. It is. I could go and do this again tomorrow and probably shuffle most of them around. The, yeah. the bottom two are always going to be the bottom two for me. You've got them higher. The top five, now they may interchange at times, but they're always going to kind of be my top five until a new album comes out. Who knows? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So for me, at number seven, we've got, as you've mentioned, on the 13th day. Yeah, strong. This is a, another great album here. And Fancy Digipack and everything, this was very much what people were doing at the time. And as you say, great art on this. Bloodbird Laughter, Shadow Town, So Let It Rain, Dance of the Black Tattoo. There's great rock on here. There's, there's great pomp on here. See, we've, we've spoken about that. That's the thing. There, there are the ballads. Bob Cartley's on top form. I mean, Bob Cartley's a, shall we say, an older gentleman by this stage. And it's oh, yeah. incredible that he can do this. But he can do it live. There's no tricks. There's no nonsense. He's just a singer. Man, can he sing. And it, he can cover the bases. And that's what I really like about this is I think he shines on this, but there's a great atmosphere on this album. That's a really good album. Yeah, I agree. It's, it's good. I enjoy that one quite a bit. All right. My number, what are we, seven now, right? Seven. How about the Bobcat Goldthwait album? <laughs> <laughs> the 11th Take hour. It Take it away. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, look at that, guys. Uh, look, look, just look at that. It's Bobcat. Oh, man. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, how you, how you doing? My name is Bob Cat Goldthwait. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, but uh, but you know, in all honesty, though, a fantastic record, a fantastic record here. I I really enjoy yeah. this a lot, and I think the the artwork just kind of gets you in the mood for what's contained in the music. Just uh, yeah, oh, excellent yeah. stuff. All right, number six. So, I, I don't think that any better rec recommendation for a band that have been on the go for over 40 years than to say that we're this high with the newest album. I'm at number six, and this, this was released this year. That's incredible. We're, do we're going back to the, the late 70s, mid 70s for the early stuff, and we're still in 2020 creating albums that are just knocking you sideways. Madness or Messiah, The Serpent Rings Itself, The Great Unknown. It's just... Everything that you want from a great atmospheric hard rock album that just has spirit, it's got atmosphere, incredible. I mean, most bands, to me, I would tell you that Magnum and Uriah Heap are the only bands that have been on the go that long, consistently releasing albums that are this good. I agree with you, and we are on the same page here. The Serpent Rings is also falling at the same place for me. I've listened to this so much since this came out, and I think this is just yeah. a, you know, where are you, Eden? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I've picked out three, but you could pick out them all. But you, I mean, just, it, it's top to bottom. I mean, the title track, top to bottom, it's just one anthem after another. The songs yeah. are so memorable and catchy. I'm like, And, and the uh, thing is, as well, this is a band at this stage that I've had a few changes. Do you know Mark Stanway, who was the long-standing keyboard player, he's been gone right. for a couple of albums. And we've got, we've got Dennis Ward, who's 
and Cream 69 and loads of different stuff coming in to play bass on this and, and you can kind of hear a, a few influences there. Most bands at this stage who make, and Harry James is gone, so we've got three newer members on this, this album. Most bands are falling apart if they do that now. Do you know? That's absolutely correct, yeah. Yeah, they're still still making a go of it. And yeah, that's that's Bob Catley right there. So he's Bob not Catley, he's yeah. not a you know a real, real young guy, and he still sounds fantastic. In yeah. fact, absolutely the first time you heard this album and you listened to the House of Kings, what did you think? I could have sworn I was like, what has he got? Rob Halford guesting on this song? Yeah. And it's, it's incredible, isn't it? Yeah. It's Bob Catley singing. I'm like, yeah. holy smokes. That, that's the thing that, that struck me is the energy that's in his voice at this stage in his career is ridiculous. And you always think to yourself, you know, yeah, in the studio these days, you can do so many different things. And then you go see this band live and they can still do this live. And, and there's no mucking about it. I mean, I saw him in between eras. He did a solo show and... I mean, they kept the window open for him just playing an acoustic thing. He just came out and played acoustic guitar, 12 string, and various things. He was great. He could sing on the night. And you thought, how, how will Bob Cartley handle following, you know, a great... and he was just outstanding. He was, shall we say, he'd had a tipple or two before he came on stage. And it was the last show of the tour in a place called Strawberry Fields in Glasgow, which I think is something Ivory Black's now, which is about the size of my hand. That's how small the venue was. And it wasn't packed. Man, he was brilliant. He was absolutely brilliant. And he just, he still is, you know, yeah, amazing. He is. By the way, speaking of Bob Catley, uh, he's got a couple really cool solo albums that I have, which are dynamite as well. Yes. Those are the albums that he worked on with, uh, I'm trying to think who, who was. Hughes. Yes, from 10. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Those and are very I, good. I, I prefer <laughs> the solo stuff that Bob did with Gary Hughes than to anything that 10 did. So if you like 10, and you've not got into what you did with Bob Cartley, you really are missing out. You really should investigate those albums. Great yeah, stuff. Yeah, they're very, very good. Yeah, exactly. Very good. Okay. The so, top five. We're hitting the top five now, and these, to me, anyone who's read some of my reviews over the time, I don't hand out too many five out of fives. I'm struggling to tell you that not all of these albums are five out of five. So we're at Chase the Dragon here, and these are just lyrics on the back. This, this is back in the day. You know, this is 1982. This is when all this stuff was beautiful, and they handed you a package that was just outstanding. You know? And that's one of his. That's one of Rodney's iconic covers, right there. Yeah, that's that's just absolutely that's beautiful. Just, yeah, it's phenomenal. Artwork in its own right. And as I say, you go on his website. He does stuff for Nazareth and oh, Asia, and oh yeah, 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 and it's all fantastic. But here you've got the spirit. I mean, that's an absolute classic by this band, Soldier of the Line. There's a lot of war songs. Tony does like a war song. Do you know? He understands them too. It's not glorification and it's not modeling. He tries to explain the the attraction of war, but then the tragedy of war. And he does it right. really well. Uh, and it's a theme right the way through, right the way through the whole catalogue. But you you never get tired of hearing these stories. Well, I never get tired of, of hearing these stories. He writes the lyrics too. Amazing. But yeah, we're, we're, we're in gold now. We're in gold territory now. Oh yeah, no, I, I, that's that's a great one. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Uh, <laughs> my number five, Magnum Two. There you go. I like, this, I like this album a lot. Again, those first two albums are very prog rock like, and and I yeah. I totally get that uh, the band is still trying to really kind of find their way. Yeah. But when you release two albums out of the gate that are as good as these, you know. Great yeah. Adventure, The Battle, I mean, you, know, you talk about the war stuff, uh, So Cold, The Night, Foolish Heart. I mean, I don't know. I like yeah, this album. Just, it, I don't like the album than, cover. The yeah, album cover is awful. awful. Don't like the but, co yeah, I mean, they never got on with the record label, and it kind of shows at certain points, but but there you go. I mean, I've got, just because it was in the pile that I lifted, but you've got, this is not in the list, but this is Marauder, this is a live album. This, to me, does the songs off those first two albums. Even better. A little bit better, but that's just a personal thing. I mean, I still wish... I, I don't have that. I need to get that. Oh, so, I don't want to get too deep in it because I'm talking all night here, but there's lots of little curios in the Magnum discography. There's lots of great live albums that kind of cover off eras or cover off little albums. So they do like the Wings of Heaven album's got a whole live album all to itself. Which is very good, yeah. Stronghold, which is demos from the early years that kind of worked in about the first two albums. I think they're better than some of the stuff that's on the first two albums. There is, there's Keep the Night Light Burning that we were speaking about just before we started this. That's an, an acoustic album. That should be throwaway rubbish. It's not throwaway rubbish. 
So <laughs> you get into this band, there's lots to discover. Lots to discover. There you so, go. Number four. Number four. My number four. So we're at the visitation. That's what we've got. So I've got the, the, the digi version here. And this is this was much lower on your one, but I think that the, the latter day stuff that I like does have a hint of the earlier stuff on it. So and I do quite like this. This is a, a nice composite piece yeah, where they, they put is. all the band in over and over and over in the same place. Not quite so exciting inside, but it's <laughs> it's still a it's still a cool thing. Um I just another one I can't find a weak moment on black skies. It's like a lost gem, Mother's Nature's finest dance. I just the atmosphere on these just captures my my imagination and it takes me. And something that I, I do like to mention as well is iconic. I mean, you're you're wearing a great Iron Maiden shirt there, okay? And Iron Maiden's logo is immediately iconic. How many bands have had more than one iconic logo? Well, Magnum have three or four. Yeah, and that, and that that's crazy. I mean, this is a latter day one from the latter day earlier stuff. Should I say the kind of mid era? If you look at that and it says Magnum, but down the bottom here you've you've got sword with the M on it, and they use that in it too. And there's another three or four where you just look at them and you go, "That's Magnum." Yep, that's incredible. <laughs> there you go. Anyway, I digress. <laughs> <laughs> that's all cool little stuff, though. I mean, that's yeah. this is one of those bands you can talk about these things. Um, my number four, have you have already discussed? And like I said, it's the first one I ever got, so it ranks pretty high for me. Uh, Brand New Morning from 2004. Wow. Uh, yeah. Wow. I just, right, okay. Again, uh, and I talk about this a lot on this show, sometimes the first album you hear by a band really kind of sticks with you. I, I'm going to back that up, yes. Right. I mean, and the title track is a great song. Yeah. It's such a great song. And, uh, you know, it's time to come together. I breathe for you, you know, the blue and the gray. I think that this album, again, another one of their more really accessible albums, but I don't mind that from them. And I think and the Scarecrow, I mean, I don't know. Yeah. I, I like this album a lot. I like it a lot. Yep. And uh, again, sometimes those early ones you fell in love with, they stick with you. Yes, absolutely. And my top three backs that up perfectly because I understand you've got this lore. I understand why you have Vigilante from 1986 lore. What I like about this is what a lot of people don't like about this is the drum sound. It's big and it's booming and it's no surprise that Roger Taylor is part of the production team on this album. It's got that a kind of magic where the drums, they almost distort if you put a good pair of headphones on they almost have a about them. A lot of people don't like that. Uh, it was eighty. It was eighty six, right? And that's that's what you got. Absolutely, yeah. that's what they were doing. And, and the songs like Holy Rider, Midnight, it's just, it's not a dark album. It's not brooding and intense, but there's a a kind of strong fragility. And I know that's a complete contradiction in terms, but it, it, the songs just have that. They've got heart. It's what they, they do to me. But it's heart in a pop song. And that's, that's very unusual. But yeah, this album means a lot to me. Anyone that knows Magnum and has fallen this will under, they'll know what I've got left. They'll know this is either that I came to the band. So there you go. As you say, you try and be objective, you try and look at it and just rank it on songs. But albums mean something to you. And this album, although the back cover lets it down a little bit, this album <laughs> is a record for me. I had this on cassette back in the day and I had the Walkman on. This was a constant companion as I walked around, do you know? So... I, I, I love this album, I have to say. There you go. Those personal stories are the best. And, uh, yep. it's just, that's what's the great thing about music, right? Absolutely is. My number three. Yeah. And, 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 and most people will agree with you, I think, over me. You're, you're saying I'm the massive Magnum fan. I agree. I think most Magnum fans will see how low I've got the first two and will be shocked and, and probably quite annoyed. Fair enough. That's the way it goes. As, as you always say, you rank them how you like them. And, and, and that's, that's, you like it. that's right. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, well, let's reiterate again, there are no stinkers in this catalog. So everybody's no going to rank these albums differently. And that's the way it should be. Because if we all liked them the same way, it'd be a pretty freaking boring world, right? Yeah. So, absolutely. Um, so that's my number three. All right, the top two. Okay. Top two. Wings of Heaven. There you go. So this is wow. not an archetypal Magnum album. This, no, it's not. Yeah. This is almost as pop as they get. 
I would say we're verging on AOR, but the atmosphere on this album is just intense. You can tell that they were kind of close to making it because they had an inner sleeve by this stage. Oh, you didn't yeah, get an yeah. inner sleeve unless the record company thought you were going to do something, do you know? And and they did have hits on this, as I say, Days of No Trust, Start Talking Love, It Must Have Been Love. These were hits over here. And they had a profile. People were talking about Magnum. Nobody talked about Magnum in my world until this album came out. But the reason that this one is so high for me is Don't Wake the Lion, Too Old to Die Young. You're saying that they don't have epics. They don't really, but this one is 10 minutes and 34 seconds long. And to That's me, epic for them, yeah. If there's one song that you should listen to to see if you're going to like Magnum, listen to Don't Wake the Lion. It's a rock song. It's heavy, but it's slow, and it builds, and it's got atmosphere. It's another one about war. But the lyrics are accessible. You can understand what he's telling you. There's a real story here. There's heartbreak here. That, that to me, although it's not on my number one album, that's the one song I would say. If you want to like Magnum, Listen to Don't Wait the Lie. There you go. There you go. Well said. Well said. My number two from 1982, Chase the Dragon. Yeah. I mean, it's, I don't know. Totally love yeah. this album. You know, it's, yeah. uh, I think. And, and you've said already, look at the artwork too. I mean, I know we're talking about the music, but to me. It's beautiful, yeah. Yeah. But, you know, we all play the game, the lights burned out, Soldier of the Line, the Edge of the World. I mean, it's, it's, great it's it's kind of proggy still but it's got the big choruses and the booming keyboards and the, the you know and that voice that voice yeah, that voice, that voice. That voice. Go back to that voice well we, I, I think we we both should just hold up our number ones because i think the, <laughs> obviously we know what's left here right so uh yeah <laughs> i mean i nearly ruined it because actually the because of the current situation and all these things we keep talking about but rodney matthews has actually done a zoom background for this but i thought it would be slightly a bit of a giveaway if i sat in this hall with this behind me yeah true, true. i thought will i use it will i not because it is beautiful and it is amazing and it is free if you want to go and download it too he's giving it away for nothing but this is on a storyteller's night this is 1985 this is where i came in i'm so pleased that for someone that, that came into the band later that this is still where it's at you know yeah, I mean, I honestly, could talk about every song, and you can't really see because over the years the, the yellow print, yeah, faded yeah, slightly yeah. on the back on the yellow print on the grey. How far Jerusalem on a storyteller's night? Uh, Les Morts Dansant, excuse my bad pronunciation. Two hearts, all England's eyes. I say that as a proud Scotsman. But <laughs> every, but every song, every song on this album deserve to be a hit, or deserve to be massive. Do you know? There you are, yeah. There's the hat. That, yeah, there's the hat. And that's, that's, not a, that's not a great look. That tells you why they never, that, that's why they weren't massive. Look at that picture. That's, as I say, we're in 1985 here. That picture looks like it was taken in 1974, doesn't it? <laughs> you know? And that, that's the problem more than anything else. But, I mean, Mark Stanway's keyboards linking with Tony Clarkin's guitar on this. As I say, he's a guy, Tony Clark is a guy that's a great guitarist. The solos, that he plays are, are brilliant, but they're for the songs. But to let everyone else shine the way that he does, that to me is why, that, that's why we've got 20 albums here to talk about. Because if he hadn't done that, well, we wouldn't have 20 albums because it wouldn't have yeah. lasted that long. But this, this is a favorite album of all time for me, not just Magnum, any band. That, of all time, wow, yeah. yeah. And uh, a lot of the people who I've talked to over the years, uh, you know, when the topic of Magnum come up, they always seem to cite that album. It's usually that one or Kingdom of Madness gets mentioned the most. Yep. Uh, and I think on a storyteller's night is just uh, from a storytelling perspective. I know it's kind of cliche yeah. to say that. Uh, it's just really memorable, and every song is a great, just rock solid anthem. Great hooks, great keyboards, great guitar work, fantastic vocals, atmosphere. The whole the production is great on it as well yeah and i think it we just clicked off like every every box and that I, I, the, the one other thing i would add to that too is something that i don't think so many bands do now but, but magnum still managed to do is sequencing i know that sequencing's a, a dying art because you know I, I i'm old at heart i don't do playlists I don't, I don't do buttons. I, I put an album. I mean, there was a thing on Twitter recently where they said, choose three albums that you can listen to from start to finish without skipping any tracks. Well, that's every album I listen to. I, I'm the same way. I'm the same I, way. I, I'm, I, a, I'm an album guy. 
but the sequences of, of this album, how it builds, how it flows, but it's, the, it's like a good rock show. It doesn't just do that. It doesn't just start low and build. It, it takes you on a journey. Yeah, and it's the way it should. Yeah, absolutely. I can't recommend that high enough, I have yeah. to say. Good. Well, there you have it, guys. Ranking the albums of this big, gigantic catalog of Magnum. This was a great conversation. And again, for those of you who are new to this band, this is hopefully we've given you some guidance on where to go. Um, yeah, it's this is a great band, great catalog. I would say start anywhere. You know, maybe get this one first because it's probably the best representation of who they are as a band in general. But if you wanted to start anywhere, you won't regret it because these are all really good albums. Uh, I'm sure Stephen yep. will agree with that. And yeah, absolutely. Um, so thanks yeah. for, for coming on this journey with us, everyone. We really appreciate it. And this is on the web at www.seatranquility.org. We're on Facebook, we're on Twitter, of course, we're here on YouTube all the damn time. So Stephen, thanks for coming on here the first time. Get used That's to his face because he's going to be on here quite a bit going forward. <laughs> and uh, we're going to, Stephen and I are going to start doing on a fairly regular basis, like maybe once every couple of weeks, we're going to do like a new product review show. And he's going to join us on these top 10 songs and ranking the albums and all sorts of other fun stuff we've got going forward. Yep. Cause uh, I'm going to make him do double duty now, instead of just reviewing CDs on the website, he's got to appear on camera next to this mug. Uh, every working so long. me hard. He's working me hard. <laughs> <laughs> So thanks, everybody. We appreciate it. Hope you enjoyed this, and we'll see you real soon. Have a good evening, and uh, we'll see everybody tomorrow. Stephen, I'll talk to you soon. Thank you, Will.